Good day. Today is Thursday, 21st November 2024, and I'm making this program even later than usual over the last couple of days. But events have um, dictated my decision to make uh, this video today because a very important event has happened. Russia has responded in ways that I think nobody had anticipated to the um, attackums and sto storm shadow attacks on its territory. And we have had a speech to the Russian people about this by President Putin. And the speech itself and the nature of the Russian response, which is to use, to deploy a previously unknown advanced hypersonic missile system um, has already, I think, created a significant stir in the West and grown great alarm um, across the world. And indeed, it should alarm us all. Anyway, the thing I'm going to do first, as I always do in these kind of situations, is I'm going to read out what President Putin himself has said. And we have the statement, the full statement has been published by the Kremlin on its website. And I'm going to read it out. And it's a statement by the Russian Fed president of the Russian Federation. Uh, Putin was speaking from his desk in his office in the Kremlin, an office very familiar to Russians. It was previously used by other Russian leaders. It is perhaps most famous to Russians for having been the desk, the office used by the former Soviet leader, Joseph Stalin, from which he directed Russia's victory in the Second World War. Anyway, this is what Putin said. I would like to inform the military personnel of the Russian Federation Armed Forces, citizens of our country, our friends across the globe, and those who persist in the illusion that a strategic defeat can be inflicted upon Russia about the events taking place today in the zone of the special military operation, specifically following the attacks by Western long-range weapons against our territory. The escalation of the conflict in Ukraine, instigated by the West, continues with the United States and its NATO allies, previously announcing that they authorized the use of their long-range high-precision weapons for strikes inside the Russian Federation. Experts are well aware, and the Russian side has repeatedly highlighted it, that the use of such weapons is not possible without the direct involvement of military experts from the manufacturing nations. Now, the last point I've discussed again in recent programs, Putin has made this point uh, previously. Um, I, as I mentioned, as I discussed um, in my last program, I've never heard a single Western official or seen an article in a single Western media outlet that contradicts that claim, that weapons like the Storm Shadow, the Scalp, the Attackums and the Taurus can only be launched by Ukraine with the direct involvement and participation of Western personnel. In other words, in conducting strikes using these weapons against internationally recognized Russian ter territory, these uh, countries, through their personnel who are participating in the launching of these weapons, are committing an act of war against Russia. Just to say, <laughs> just to repeat that point, because Putin is repeating it, of course, and um, I think it's one to keep in mind and to understand. And it explains some of the reasoning that he sets out um, later on in his speech. Anyway, this is what Putin then went on to say. On, no on November 19th, six Attackums tactical ballistic missiles produced by the United States 
and on November 21st, during a combined missile assault involving British Storm Shadow systems and HIMARS systems produced by the United States, attacks were carried out against military facilities inside the territory of the Russian Federation in Bryansk and Kursk region. From that point onwards, as we have repeatedly emphasized in prior communications, the regional conflict in Ukraine, provoked by the West, has assumed elements of a global nature. Our air defense system successfully counteracted these attacks, preventing the enemy from achieving their apparent objectives. The fire at the ammunition depot in the Bryansk region caused by the debris of Atakum's missiles was extinguished without casualties or significant damage. In the Kursk region, the attack targeted one of our command posts of our group of forces north. Regrettably, the attack and the subsequent air defense battle resulted in casualties, both fatalities and injuries, among the perimeter security units and servicing staff. However, the command and operational staff of the control center suffered no casualties and continues to manage effectively the operations of our forces to eliminate and push enemy units out of the Kursk region. So this is what Putin is telling us about the two attacks. He is saying that the first attack was a complete failure. Five out of the six attackers' missiles were shot down. One was damaged, and that debris from this damaged region did cause a fire, but no significant damage was done, and no casualties were caused. The combined attack, using Storm Shadow missiles and HIMARS missiles, he doesn't tell us how many Storm Shadow missiles, which was carried out in Kursk region, I think it was on the 20th rather than the 21st of November, just saying, but, you know, I may be wrong about that. Anyway, that attack was directed at one of the command posts of Group of Forces North. He says that the attack, again, was unsuccessful in that the major command post, the place which was the intended target of the attack was not hit. However, some of the missiles um, apparently did get through and conduct, carried out inflicted casualties, including deaths and injuries amongst people that he refers to as per perimeter security units and servicing staff. The command post itself was not damaged. Now, I think we can reconstruct a certain amount of information from this last comment about the attack on Kursk region. The reports claim that up to 12 Storm Shadows missiles were used. There appears, there appears to be film showing the 10 Storm Shadow missiles, showing 10 Storm Shadow missiles um, heading towards this target. Putin says that HIMARS missiles were also launched as well. Now, it seems that none of these missiles fully got through. Either they were shot down or quite plausibly, some of them, the HIMARS missiles especially, were successfully jammed. But they did cause damage to neighboring facilities, resulting in some Russian soldiers being killed or injured. Anyway, that's what he had to say about the two attacks. He then goes on to say, I wish to underscore once again that the use by the enemy of such weapons cannot affect the course of combat operations in the special military operation zone. He is absolutely right about this. As I will discuss shortly, there is an article in the BBC of all places which effectively tell, tells us as much. He then goes on to say, our forces are making successful advances along the entire line of contact and all objectives we have set will be accomplished. 
In response to the deployment of American and British long-range weapons, the Russian armed forces delivered a combat strike on November 21st on a facility within Ukraine's defense industrial complex. He is referring to the Yuzhmash rocket and missile factory in Dnepro, the former Soviet city of Dnepropetrovsk, of the Dnieper River, which was, I think I'm right in saying, the Soviet Union's biggest factory industrial facility producing intercontinental ballistic missiles and other long-range missiles. And Putin then goes on to say this, in field conditions, we also carried out tests of one of Russia's latest medium-range missile systems. In this case, carrying a non-nuclear hypersonic ballistic missile that our engineers named Oreshnik. The tests were successful, achieving the intended objective of the launch in the city of Dnepropetrovsk, that is the name the Russians use to refer to the Ukrainian city of Dnepro. To repeat again, its Soviet name was Dnepropetrovsk. In the city of Dnepropetrovsk, Ukraine, one of the largest and most famous industrial complexes from the Soviet Union era, which continues to produce missiles and other armaments, was hit. We are developing intermediate range and shorter range missiles in response to US plans to produce and deploy intermediate range and shorter range missiles in Europe and the Asia Pacific region. We believe that the United States made a mistake by unilaterally destroying the INF Treaty in 2019 under far-fetched pretexts. Today, the United States is not only producing such equipment, but as we can see, it has worked out ways to deploy its advanced missile systems to different regions of the world, including Europe, during training exercises for its troops. And it's absolutely correct, the United States is thinking of deploying such missiles in Europe. It is also in looking at deploying these systems in the Pacific region, where, of course, they will be targeting China. And this is a major issue, one of major concern to the Russians and to the Chinese. But I'm not going to discuss that aspect of this speech further in this program. And then Putin goes on to say, moreover, in the course of these exercises, they are conducting training for using them. As a reminder, Russia has voluntarily and unilaterally committed not to deploy intermediate range and shorter range mis missiles until US weapons of this kind appear in any region of the world. To restate, we are conducting combat tests of the Oreshnik missile system in response to NATO's aggressive actions against Russia. Our decision on further deployment of intermediate range and shorter range missiles will depend on the actions of the United States and its satellites. A studied insult of the European NATO states. They have now, as far as Putin is concerned, become satellites of the United States, just as the former East European members of the Warsaw Pact were satellites, were once satellites of the Soviet Union. But anyway, Putin then concludes as follows. We will determine the targets during further tests of our advanced missile systems based on the threats to the security of the Russian Federation. We consider ourselves entitled to use our weapons against military facilities of those countries that allow use of their weapons against our facilities. And in case of an escalation of aggressive actions, we will respond decisively and in mirror-like manner. So what Putin is saying here is we carried out this attack on a facility inside Ukraine. We are demonstrating the range of our capabilities no one, however, should be in any further doubt that if this continues, if this pattern of attacks continues, if Western missiles continue to attack targets in Russia, 
Russia has the means and the will to counter by attacking targets in the countries that have attacked it, by which he means the NATO countries, including Britain, in this case, Britain and the United States. And he goes on to say, I recommend that the ruling elites of these countries that are hatching plans to use their military contingents against Russia seriously consider this. Military contingents, by the way, appears to refer to possible plans to deploy ground troops. It goes without saying that when choosing, if necessary, and as a retaliatory measure, targets to be hit by systems such as Oreshnik on Ukrainian territory, we will in advance suggest that civilians and citizens of friendly countries residing in those areas leave danger zones. We will do so for humanitarian reasons, openly and publicly, without fear of counter moves coming from the enemy who will also be receiving this information. Why without this fear? Because there are no means of countering such weapons today. Missiles attack targets at a speed of Mach 10, which is 2.5 to 3 kilometers per second. I understand this particular missile was launched from a base near Astrakhan, almost certainly the giant Kapustin Yar test center and space center. And I've heard some reports that it covered the distance from Astrakhan to Dniepro in around five minutes, which is astonishing. And Putin goes on to say, air defense systems currently available in the world and missile defense systems being created by the Americans in Europe cannot intercept such missiles. It is impossible. I would like to emphasize once again that it was not Russia, but the United States that destroyed the international security system. And by continuing to fight, cling to its hegemony, they are pushing the whole world into a global conflict. We have always preferred and are ready to now to resolve all disputes by peaceful means. But we are also ready for any turn of events. So that is a signal to Donald Trump. He's saying that if Donald Trump comes and makes proposals to bring this conflict in Ukraine to an end, the Russians will listen and will work with him to try to de-escalate tensions. But if this pattern of escalation continues, if this disastrous game of chicken continues, then at some point we will find ourselves in a global crisis, and I don't have to explain what the nature of that crisis might be, and the Russians are ready for that possibility. And he finishes by saying, if anyone still doubts this, make no mistake, there will always be a response. So that is what Putin has said. The Russians have demonstrated their capability. They've launched another major strike on Dniepro itself on the Yuzmash plant, and Putin says that they've used a completely new weapon system called Oreshnik, one which has not been tested or demonstrated before. In fact, he sort of implies that this system is still under development, that it's not yet fully operational, but that the Russians used this opportunity in effect, to test the system, to see how it actually functioned in a battlefield situation. And it looks as if this attack was successful. Now, I should say that I've never heard of the Oreshnik before. The Russians have not spoken about this. Um, the speculation over the course of the hours preceding this attack or rather, uh, uh, subsequent to this attack, the speculation that appeared in the Western media was that this was an intercontinental ballistic missile that had been launched from inside Russia against Ukraine. I was deeply skeptical about this. That didn't seem to me to make 
any sort of sense at all. Intercontinental ballistic missiles are used for intercontinental warfare. In other words, for an attack ultimately on the United States. Uh, it's They're not really intended for attacks on targets inside Europe. Now, the Russians have historically developed other systems, um, intermediate range systems, missile systems. Back in the 1970s and 1980s, they developed a system called the SS-20 in the West. The Russians refer to that particular system as the Pioneer. And that was a shorter range, the very advanced missile system for its day. And it was intended to target particular locations inside Europe from the territory of the, of the Western Soviet Union. And the pioneer, the SS-20, was, of course, dismantled by the Soviets as part of the Intermediate Nuclear Forces Treaty, the INF Treaty, agreed by Presidents Putin Presidents Gorbachev and Reagan in, from memory, 1986 or 1987. Um, and no such weapons have appeared since. But the INF Treaty has been living on life support ever since the United States in 2019 announced that it was withdrawing from it. And Putin is absolutely right to say that the United States, that in light of that US decision, the Russians have been warning that they would develop alternative, rather more modern intermediate nuclear force systems in case the United States followed through on their threats to start deploying their own. And it's clear that these programs have advanced significantly. There was some speculation again earlier today that the missile that was launched against this target in Dnepro was a system called the Rubej. Again, I had some problems with this because the Rubej, which to be very clear, is a very powerful system and one with intermediate range. But there were reports that the Rubej system had been either cancelled or put on ice um, several years ago, and that in any event, development of it was not expected to resume until 2027, when hypersonic uh, warheads would be developed for it. My impression is, and it's just my impression, is that the Oreshnik is a completely different system from the Rubej, and it is clearly not a intercontinental ballistic system. Clearly, the Russians have had various systems under development to counter possible American deployments of intermediate nuclear weapons in Europe. And Putin and the Russians decided that in response to the American and British and Ukrainian missile attacks, on Russian territory, this would be a good opportunity to test one of these systems, the Oreshnik, in an operational environment. And we've been hearing reports that there was a massive explosion and that um, prior to striking the target, apparently multiple warheads were released by this missile. It, each one of which was also moving at hypersonic speeds. And, well, Putin claims, and I've no reason to doubt what he's saying is true, that this particular system could not be intercepted by Western air defense systems. Now, since we're talking about a system under development, one must wonder how many of these systems the Russians are able to deploy. But then... The same question can be asked about the attackers and the storm shadows. Obviously, these are well-established old systems that have been around for a long time. But the attackers 
seems to be out of production. There's been contradictory statements said about this, but the latest reports that I've seen from the United States have convinced me that production of the Atakams missile stopped as long ago as about 2006 and that the missile has not been put back in production since then. As for the Storm Shadow and the Scalp, the French equivalent of these two systems, they are in production. But the level, the production rate is extremely low because these are handmade. These are essentially handmade missiles. It has been impossible to establish an industrial scale production line for these missiles. They were not designed to be produced in that way. And they depend, therefore, on being produced by very skilled workers and technicians working in the relatively small numbers that one would expect. So, supposedly, Ukraine only had around 50 Attackums missiles before the recent attack took place, in which case it's down to 44, presumably. Um, there's less information on how many storm shadows Ukraine has, but it is widely acknowledged that the number, again, is very small. And the French have supposedly only provided 10 scalp missiles to Ukraine and that there aren't many more to supply of these either. So I am not going to guess how many Oreshnik missiles the Russians have or of their potential production rate. Probably it is quite low. But bear in mind that we're talking about a vastly more powerful weapon. And the Russians have many other very powerful weapons as well that they can also use, like the hypersonic Kinjal and the Tsirkon missile, which apparently was also used in the big strike that the Russians conducted on Ukraine a few days ago. Apparently, two Tsirkon missiles attacked successfully targets in Kiev itself. So we're talking about a very potential, very powerful Russian capability, even if, as I said, there aren't very many of these Oreshnik missiles available. But this is not the main point of what Putin is saying. What he is basically saying to the West is, look, this is your final warning. I told you some weeks ago, and again, I told you that even some months ago as well, don't launch missiles of this kind against us. If you do, we know perfectly well who is responsible for operating these missiles and for preparing these missiles. You are, not the Ukrainians. It is you who are. You are conducting attacks against our territory. If you persist in doing this, as you have now done, then Inevitably, as night follows day, we are going to reciprocate. We are going to do the same to you. We have that capability. We've just demonstrated that we do. You have no means to shoot down a system like the Oreshnik system. It is a hypersonic ballistic missile that you have no means to intercept. Your air defense interceptors cannot do that. You are inviting potential attacks by us against you. And what you need to do is to cool down, start to be realistic about this, and start thinking sensibly and rationally about your way forward. Because if we are attacked in a way that constitutes an attack, of, uh, a, an act of war, like any self-respecting country, we will be obliged to retaliate. Now, again, many people are in denial about this. They persist in saying that Putin is bluffing. 
I'm not quite sure why they think that. Is it because Western countries have nuclear weapons? Of course they do. But Israel has nuclear weapons. And as we have seen, Iran has been prepared to conduct two big missile strikes against Israel, despite the fact that Israel has nuclear weapons. And that has been a very alarming development. The Israelis have conducted two airstrikes of their own against Iran. There are arguments and discussions about how effective those airstrikes were. I'm leaning to the view that they were largely ineffective, but I accept I might be wrong. If the Russians launch missile strikes against the Western powers, are the Western powers prepared to retaliate against Russia, risking nuclear war? If they do, they must be mindful of the fact that the Russian air defense system is of a level of sophistication such as they have never encountered in any war before. And it is overwhelmingly likely, in fact, it is a total certainty that any Western pilots sent to attack Russian facilities, bear in mind, we're talking about Russian facilities located in faraway places like Astrakhan, Russian facilities, attacking Russian facilities, at least a proportion of them, perhaps the majority of them, will be shot down. So this is irrational. It is absurd. Putin, in speaking in the way he does, is confident that he has world opinion behind him. He's made that very clear. He's made it very clear that he will warn his friends, his friendly countries around the world, of what he might be prepared to do. Um, so I don't think we should take this threat anything other than extremely seriously. It, it staggers me that people still do. If the Russians do strike, do conduct strikes against facilities in the West, which is what Putin is warning, what do the Western powers do in response? What do Baerbock and Habeck and Macron and Le Cornu and Starmer and Healy and Lamy and um, Biden and Sullivan and Blinken, what do they do in response to that? What can they do? Send the US Air Force to strike targets in Russia with the consequences that I said, or risk nuclear war. Anyway, that was Putin's, those were Putin's words. I would say that my overwhelming sense in Britain, of course, I'm not in Britain at the moment, but I do follow commentaries, commentaries that have been appearing in the British media. My overwhelming sense is that opinion in Britain is overwhelmingly un negative, deeply unhappy about what has happened. I'm not referring here to this attack with the Oreshnik on the Epro, on the Epro or Putin's speech. I am referring rather to the attack of the storm shadows in Kursk region. I think the general sentiment amongst the British public is that this is going far too far. Up to now, British opinion has become, well, gradually less and less enthusiastic and supportive of the war, but they've not been in outright opposition to it. If this continues on this path for much longer, that will change. In fact, I sense that it is changing now. Of course, I may be wrong, but I would say this, in these matters, my judgment 
has tended to be more accurate than that of the various political leaders and commentators and pundits who have argued otherwise. Anyway, we shall see what happens over the next couple of days, whether having done what they have done, the Ukrainians, the British, the Americans and the French, and perhaps the Germans too, decide to pull back, or whether they will continue on this reckless path of escalation, which can only end in, at the very least, a humiliating disaster. And that will be the best outcome. At worst, a catastrophe. As I said, I don't want to even envisage, imagine, let alone discuss. Anyway, that's Putin's words. Now, what as I said, makes all this so extraordinary, is that it's not as if any of this is succeeding in terms of the actual war. We've had a most interesting article from the BBC, of all places, which basically tells us as much, that Ukraine is, in effect, losing the war. The article, um, which uh, recently appeared, uh, actually spoke about concerns that Ukraine might be on the brink on the brink of outright collapse. <laughs> um, the article um, the article in fact, its title is Ukrainian Front could collapse as Russian gains ex accelerate experts warn. And we're then told that President Biden's decision to provide anti-personnel mines to Ukraine and allow the use of long-range missiles on Russian territory comes as the Russian military is accelerating its gains along the front line. Data from the Institute for the Study of War, an institute, by the way, which has been fervently confident about Ukraine's prospects, shows that Russia has gained almost six times as much territory in 2024 as it did in 2023 and is advancing towards key Ukrainian logistical hubs in the eastern Donbass region. Meanwhile, Ukraine's surprise incursion into Russia's Kursk region is faltering. Russian troops have pushed Kiev's offensive backwards. Experts have questioned the success of the offensive, with one calling it a strategic catastrophe, given manpower shortages faced by Ukraine. I've spoken previously about this utterly ill-judged euphoria we repeatedly get from Western commentators whenever some decision by the Western powers is made to support Ukraine. We had another such bout of euphoria back in August when Ukraine launched its August offensive. All sorts of people, of course, offensive. All sorts of people were saying that this had turned the tables on the Russians. What we now see is an analyst, a Western military analyst, telling the BBC that the Kursk incursion was a strategic catastrophe. Well, without, as I said, wanting to blow my trumpet too much, if you had been listening to the programmes on this channel, you would have heard that very same thing said back in August. You'd have heard the same thing, of course, on the Duran and from Alex Christophorou's channel. You would have read the same thing in all sorts of places in independent media if you were listening or reading Jim Webb's Twitter uh, posts, uh, messages, uh, X messages and those sort of things. You would have seen that the consensus amongst many military experts back in August was that the Kursk incursion was a massive act of folly. And we now have the admission in the BBC. And can I just say again that when judging the progress of the war, 
the various developments in the war, the ones that have been happening consistently over the last couple of years, well, you should not listen to these people who take out the sham pull out the champagne corks and become incredibly happy when something, some minor event happens or some event happens, which uh, supposedly shows Ukraine turning the tables because whatever advantage is actually gained is going to be ephemeral and it is the Russians who in the end will continue to advance and eventually win. And then we go on to read, this is from the BBC, in the first few months of the war, the front line moved quickly, with Russia gaining ground quickly before being pushed back by Ukrainian offensive. But in 2023, nine of the side made any major gains, with the conflict largely sliding into stalemate. But new ISW figures suggest the story in 2024 is more favorable for Russia. The ISW bases its analyses on confirmed social media footage and reports of troop movements. That is being altogether too polite to the ISW, but that's another matter. The ISW data um, shows Moscow's forces have seized 2,700 square kilometers of Ukrainian territory so far this year, compared with just 465 square kilometers in the whole of 2023, a near six-fold increase. Dr. Marina Myron, a defence researcher at King's College, London, suggested to the BBC that there was a possibility the Ukrainian Eastern Front might actually collapse. Those words, might actually collapse, are in quotation marks, if Russia continued to advance at pace. More than 1,000 square kilometres was taken between 1st September and 3rd November, suggesting the push accelerated in recent months. And uh, we're then told the two areas bearing the brunt of these advances are Kupiansk in the Kharkov region and Kurahovo, a stepping stone to the key logistical hub of Pakrovsk in Donetsk region. Well, again... If you've been listening to these programs on this channel, you will have heard me say many times over the course of the last couple of months that the Russian offensive is accelerating. It is gaining momentum. We're not yet looking at blitzkrieg war warfare or anything like that. The Ukrainians are still resisting to the extent that they can. But the fact remains that the Russian advances have been getting faster. They've been growing faster month by month by month. Today, by the way, there's been news of further Russian advances. There are reports that the Ukrainians have now pulled out of central Kurakovo, that they're now basically retreating to the western part of Kurakovo. The Russian Defense Ministry has said that the village of Dalye to the south of Kurakovo is indeed under Russian control. And there have been further reports of more Russian advances in Kupiansk itself and in Chasovyar. I'm going to discuss all those military developments in much more detail in a few days when I'm back in London. But regardless, the key point as I've said already, is that the war, the direction of the war, is now such that it cannot be changed. A few missiles lobbed at the colossal territory of Russia is not going to change the outcome of the war. A few missiles lobbed at the Russian army, the huge Russian army, around a million strong now, is not going to change the outcome of the war. The war is lost. And to repeat again a point I have made many times, the sooner this fact is recognised, the sooner people appreciate and understand that the Russians are not going to be defeated in this war, the better it will be for everyone, including, by the way, 
for Ukraine. I say that, after all, even President Zelensky himself is now grudgingly admitted, admitting that the Ukrainians lack the means to recapture Crimea or to push the Russians back to their 1991 borders, which begs the question, therefore, why in that case is he still fighting? I would add that, of course, in his most recent speech, the one I've just read out, Putin says the same thing. He says that the Russians will achieve all of their objectives, that this war is effectively won by them. What the Ukrainians are doing, what the Western powers are doing, cannot change that outcome. So let us finally see some sense in this. We have two months left of this disastrous administration in Washington. Let us hope that in that time, the forces of reason, which do exist in the United States, finally prevail and persuade the president and his officials, or perhaps take even more drastic action to stop the president and his officials. I'm not suggesting how that can be done, by the way. To bring this slow motion disaster, which is now becoming a fast motion disaster, at least to a stop. As for President Donald Trump, he has suffered a political setback. Today, his choice, his pick for Attorney General, Matt Gates, has pulled out. It was most unlikely, I think, that he would have got confirmation from the Senate. We'll see who Trump appoints or nominates, I should say, in his place. But in the meantime, it is becoming ever more urgent that as soon as he becomes president, he hits the ground running, calls Putin and agrees without any further delay, a de-escalation in Ukraine, which must mean, obviously, a cessation of missile strikes on Russia, but also a final ending of military and financial support for Ukraine and advice to President Zelensky to begin talks. Well, that ends my programme for the today. As always, I apologise for the poor quality of the lighting, but I do as well as well as I can. Well, that's me. Just to remind you once more, you can find all our programs on our various platforms, Locals, Rumble and X. You can support our work via Patreon and Subscribestar and by going to our shop, links under this video. Last but not least, please remember, if you've liked this video, to press the like button. That's me for today. More from me soon. Have a very good day.